Great. Great. And you can see that as well? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Great. So those are the two girls I was just speaking about. That's Rebecca, my oh, older daughter. Oh, cute. <laughs> who's eight, and my younger daughter, Charlotte, who's five. Okay, so I'm ready whenever you are. Um, if you wanna, if you want to, uh, um, uh, can we uh, give them a couple of more minutes, please? Sure. If yeah, you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And actually, we can start with a little warm-up uh, poll. I like to use use these polls uh, to uh, to check in with everyone. So you can see, uh, you should see that link in the chat. And if you click that, it should open up to a, a little warm-up poll. Yeah. And you can just include one word that describes how you're feeling today. This is going to be a, a, a word <laughs> cloud. Okay, it can be any word. You guys you go choose. ahead. It's anonymous, so don't worry about anything. Um, all of these polls, I'm going to share a few polls. They're all anonymous, so don't have to be shy or there's no right or wrong answer. It's just to get a feel for each other. And then once you put in your response, you'll see your other people's responses as well. Yeah. So have you started in-person classes in New York then? Uh, well, not, no, not for CUNY, not for the city university where I teach. Hmm. And uh, the elementary schools, yes, they're, they have some classes in person. Um, Your kids but, go to actually in-person classes? No, no, <laughs> we, we, we left the city for the pandemic and they're on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So, well, I see some people are feeling tired and exhausted. <laughs> it's been a long day, but you know, we've been looking forward to this because uh, CUNY people are very popular over here because we had uh, Jer uh, Jeff Jarvis, we had Carrie Brown. Oh, great. Oh, great. Okay, glad to hear that. Yeah, so I hear, I hear some people, uh, I, I see some people feeling dejected, confused, other people relaxed, alive, good, <laughs> motivated. So a lot of different uh, different feelings going on, and um, all of those are understandable <laughs> given the the strange moment in, in time that we're living in at at the moment. Tired, yeah, that's a singular word, yeah. People are still motivated, yeah, that's. Yeah, I found I found that uh, the sleep is the is the fundamental habit, right? It's the habit that underlies all of the other habits. And uh, if you're feeling tired, you can't do any of the other things you need to do or want to do, as well as you'd like to do them. So for me, that's been one of the key takeaways from the pandemic is is um, a chance to reorient myself and and get the the fundamental habits back on track in terms of sleep, eating. Mindfulness, fitness, those are the, the, uh, the four kind of core, core things. And then you can do good work in journalism and you can do good, good work in, in learning and teaching and all of the other things we want to do. One more minute and we'll get started. Jeremy, if you don't mind. Sure, sure, that's fine. Yeah, and actually, why don't we switch to uh, the next poll for those who are here. Um, on time, I'm curious. Um, uh, over the last 48 hours, what are the news format? Uh, what news format have you used the most? Go uh, ahead, guys, please. We have newspapers 23, letters 20, TV 13, podcast 
what is it? Oh, 13 percent. And I'm curious for those who said other, what were some of the things that you said? If any what are others, guys? Can you just? Um... You can use the chat or you can unmute whatever you prefer. Word of mouth. Yes, no. Word of mouth. Email, Twitter. It's always a good, always a good source of news. You know who's telling, telling you something. So did hey guys, guys is, is, can you just mute your mics, please? Digital news is definitely one of the uh, the dominant um, ones in this group. Uh, although people are also reading. Eighty-eight percent digital news. Um, Instagram. Shall we begin or do you want to? Yes, yes, let's further? get started, please. Okay, minute. great. So I'm going to share my screen and, and um, basically have a few things to talk about today. Um, the first is um, my thoughts on the ecosystem. So the, the whole world of journalism, I think, is going through a kind of a, an evolution and also a revolution. And I want to share with you a little bit of how I see that and a little bit of the inspiration that I draw from a lot of the new exciting things that are happening in the ecosystem, the new products and services that are emerging. And specifically, um, I'll, I'll highlight some specific examples around the newsletter, um, uh, the newsletter ecosystem, which I see here a lot of you are, are already plugged into. 17% um, noted that that was one of the, the formats you used most. And, uh, and then I'll spend, um, the, the last part of my presentation time talking about um, how you can do this effectively, how you can start something new. So I believe very, very strongly in this idea that we're moving into a, a creator economy. That's a, a, an economy driven by creators and independents. And journalism, like other spheres, will be increasingly um, impacted by innovations from independent journalists and small teams. And, um, and that's happening already in the US, it's happening already in Europe, it's, it's happening uh, to, to an increasing extent all over the world. So I'll share a little bit about how you can actually individually uh, start doing this um, if you're not already doing it. And if you're already doing it, how you can build and amplify the work you're doing. So that's what I'd like to share. And then, and then uh, the last portion I'll open up for, for questions and discussion. And you should also feel free at any time to post questions in the chat, interrupt me. You can unmute and ask a question, that's fine. And, uh, and I will skip through th some things because we have limited time and I just wanna kind of share some, some highlights and I wanna have plenty of time for, for questions. So if you see me skipping through things or moving through things quickly, uh, that's because I wanna make sure to focus on a few key things and then to give, give us time to have a discussion. And I'll share the slides afterwards with you as a PDF, um, so you can look through it if it interests you um, at your leisure afterwards. And uh, and if we miss something or skip something for now, that's that's fine. So um, I want to make sure you're seeing my screen. So I'm going to reshare and okay. So I'm going to switch back to the slides. Okay, now do you see the slide? I just want to make sure you're seeing what I'm seeing. This is the opening slide. Yes. Can you confirm? Great. Okay, great. Okay, so so this is me. Um, uh, I'm Jeremy Kaplan. I, I teach at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. And um, I uh, live with my family outside New York City. I, I just mentioned that, uh, you know, we're, we're Kind of riding out the pandemic um, outside of the city and it's been a tremendous change for us it's i'm sure a tremendous um, change and challenge for many of you but one of the exciting things during this period is we've launched this program called the journalism creators program 
and we have just finished our first cohort. It's 100 days, it's online only, and these are the 20 people in the first cohort from all over the world. Um, we had applications from 50 different countries, um, and uh, we've just, we're just assembling the second cohort. It's, 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 a, it's our way of helping journalists from around the world create new ventures. So they're creating new newsletters, new podcasts, new websites of all kinds, new platforms to serve niche communities. And these are small projects. They're not trying to create the next Facebook. They're not trying to create the next mega um, uh, conglomerate. They're trying to create niche projects for specific communities. And that's where the, the opportunities lie in this next era for, for journalism. Um, if you're interested, you can read more about the program online. Um, and, um, and I encourage you to, 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 to think about what your side project is if you don't have one already. Uh, because one of the messages that I want to leave you with today is that I think everyone should have a project of their own. It doesn't have to be a, a full business. It can be a, a side project to learn something, to explore something, to try something out. But I think we're moving into an era where the, the people who lead, the people who succeed and thrive in the world of journalism will be those who have an entrepreneurial mindset and have the capability to help lead projects and create new things. And the best way to learn that is to do it yourself. So these are the things I'll, I'll share with you about, a little bit about the ecosystem, a little bit about some new products, how to do this. And if we have time, we can talk about the Lean Canvas, which is a, a framework that I think can be very useful for you as you're thinking about your new projects. So um, this new ecosystem um, is exciting. It's changing quickly. And it's also full of hype. So a lot of people think about technology when they think about innovation. And I want to caution you against following the herd and proclaiming the, the silver bullets that are so often lauded in this realm. So you can see here on this timeline, many of the different things that people touted as the great savior for journalism and the great innovation that will change our business models. And I'm here to suggest that actually what we really need is more incremental innovation, not this um, kind of innovation hype. So we don't need to rely on TikTok or on blockchain or on augmented reality or on virtual reality or on any of these things. Not that these things aren't useful. These things can be quite useful and, and quite interesting in their own way, but none of them are gonna save journalism. Um, what's gonna save journalism, what's gonna help journalism thrive is incremental innovation um, in, in a variety of different realms. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go through all these in detail, but essentially just to sum this up, the idea here is that we need new products and services that actually meet the needs of niche consumer groups. So we actually have to create things that are really useful for people and take a user-focused approach. Instead of doing what we've always done, creating newspapers that look the way they've always looked, TV shows that look the way they've always looked, we need to create new kinds of products for communities that have been underserved. We need to think about sustainable business models. And that's a complex and difficult subject, but there's already a lot of good lessons that are being learned. We need to think about doing reporting in new ways and being creative about the way we report. We need to think about ensuring we have more um, uh, diverse and sustainable organizations, um, meaning organizations that represent the people we actually serve. So in many countries, including the United States, the majority of people who have run news organizations have been white males in the case of the US or other kind of um, dominant sector people in other countries. And uh, we need to rethink that. We need to, we need to rethink who's actually providing this news for people and, and are they representing people adequately. Um, and then we need to defend journalists against all sorts of threats from censorship and um, violence to trolling and other kinds of um, offensive practices. Um, I, I think we used to think of, of the media ecosystem in terms of TV and, and newspapers and magazines and and radio, and now I think there's a new model that, that, that's emerging. So rather than the sort of media-driven uh, model where we think about the, the, the way that something is published on TV or radio or, or newspaper or magazine, et cetera, we need to think in terms of the size and scope of the organizations, and that's really where they're competing. So there's international organizations like these, like Shipstead, BBC, New York Times. There's these platforms that are dominant, um, like the ones that you are all familiar with, Facebook, Apple, Google, Snapchat, Twitter, et cetera. Then there are these kind of emerging venture-backed new era organizations like BuzzFeed, 538, Vox, others like that. 
Um, in the second bucket, we have these verticals. Um, uh, these are all upstarts. The verticals are the very niche specific topic specific things like skift on travel, stat on healthcare, the information on technology. We also have upstarts that are local. So these are all different kinds of niches. So the local ones are focused on a particular geographic area. The investigative ones are obviously focused on accountability journalism. And in many cases, they're not market driven, right? They're public goods, just like clean water, clean air, safe roads. Um, these are public goods that provide valuable um, information and accountability for the public. And these are also new kinds of organizations. In the last bucket in this ecosystem are, are what I call the challengers. And these are the um, curators and aggregators. And to clarify the distinction there, curators are manually, right? These are people who actually choose stories, right? They don't do original reporting though. So they play a different kind of a function like museum curators don't make the art in a museum, but they curate the art and they play a valuable function. Aggregators are more automated. So these are um, places that people are going to get automated, essentially collections of news relevant to their interests. And then there are a lot of legacy organizations that have been around a while and are trying to remake themselves, trying to, to reshape how they offer news. Um, there are lots of examples of these in each category. I won't go through a lot of them. I'll just go through a couple examples. Um, the New York Times is one that we, we at CUNY, we're next door to the New York Times. So I like using this example. Um, they've done all kinds of innovative things. And I think they serve as a good model for the way that large organizations can be innovative. Even though I focus a lot on individual innovators and independent journalists who are innovating, I think it's useful to take note of what some of the innovative large organizations are doing as well. So if you look at the New York Times, these are just four examples of innovations. They started a new cooking uh, vertical which now has um, generated um, close to a fifth or, or, or even more of their um, new subscriptions over the, the past couple of years. Um, people are subscribing, paying specifically for the cooking and games that they offer. Um, E-commerce is a new area for them. Audio is a new area for them. Um, huge, huge um, impact with their audio podcast, specifically the daily. Uh, and now video. So they have three big shows and more in development. Um, these, this is, these are on Netflix, they're on Hulu, they're on Amazon Prime, and they are reaching new people. They're bringing new people into the New York Times, a small percentage of whom then go on to become subscribers. So there's two primary strategies they have here. One is to grow the audience overall, right? And if you grow the overall audience, some percentage converts and becomes paid subscribers because they find value. And the second is direct revenue, right? So they're getting paid by Netflix, by Amazon, by Hulu, et cetera, for producing content and distributing content. Um, they're also heavy into newsletters. The New York Times has more than 50 different newsletters as does the Washington Post. Um, and these are drivers for subscriptions. So one stat that might be worth noting is that people who are subscribed to a New York Times newsletter, and this is true not just of the New York Times, it's actually true across a lot of different newspapers, the propensity to subscribe, in other words, to pay to become a, a paid subscriber is twice that of someone who's not subscribed to any newsletters. So there's a huge value and the data bears this out in having people subscribe to a newsletter because they're encountering the brand, they're getting to know the writers, the journalists, the information, they're building trust. And by doing this, the New York Times is basically planting the seeds of the next generation of um, subscribers who are gonna pay. Um, and many of these organizations, the big organizations, are spinning off niche expansions. So the Boston Globe spun out a healthcare site. Um, Atlantic Media um, spun out a, a business site, which has since been resold, et cetera, et cetera. Lots and lots of um, these big news organizations are spinning off smaller niche organizations and producing all kinds of new newsletters and podcasts and data products. And I'm not going to get into to further depth on them now. Um, these these kind of upstarts that I mentioned are creating all kinds of new things. And this is happening all over the world. It's happening in the US, but these are also examples from Spain. El Diario is in Spain, um, Tortoise is in the UK. Um, El Diario is a good example in, in that they started basically from a staff of eight about seven years ago, small little team. And now they have 56,000 members who are paying 60 euros each. To, to support the quality news that they provide. 
and, uh, and they've become one of the top outlets in Spain. So the reason I mentioned that is because we have big organizations innovating, but we also have these really tiny teams that are creating new and successful products. And that's happening in Latin America, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in the US, it's happening all over the world. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of these examples. This one you may know, John Raja actually um, started this project called How India Lives um, in, in our program in 2012. And he has um, really built that into a nice project, which some of you may, may or may not know. Um, I wanna pause here and, uh, and give you a chance to to uh, ask a question or two, and I, I want to I want to uh, to um, put that into the the Slido. So um, those of you who have the Slido up, you'll see uh, an opportunity to ask a question here. You can also unmute if you'd like to unmute. You can unmute, or you can just um, or you can just put a question here into the uh, into the Slido or into the chat, whichever you'd like. I want to just give you a chance to to pause for that. So I'm going to stop the share for a second and give you a chance to ask a question about anything we've talked about or anything we haven't talked about yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into some examples of some of these independent creators next. So what's on your mind? What else are you curious about? What, what else would you like to know more about? What specific or general questions do you have? Yeah, shoot, some, fire away guys. I'll give you some time to, to think switch into question modes. You're, you're journalists, right? And you're students, so you should have, uh, I'm sure, plenty of questions uh, rummaging around your, your minds as you're hearing some of this. If not, I'll be happy to ask you some questions. So you can choose. Um, I have a question, although I don't know if you're going to address it later on in your Please, yeah. if you would have addressed it later on anyway which is if we do have an idea um how do we know it's worth um following and pursuing and um becoming an entrepreneur for sure. without losing all our money <laughs> and time sure so i'll answer that now and then i'll, I'll expand upon it a little bit later um so uh, the first thing is that many ideas don't take much money. Many ideas take effort and they take sweat and they take persistence, but they don't necessarily take money because we're in, a, we're in an industry that's not necessarily capital intensive, right? And what I mean by that is you can start a newsletter on Substack for free. You can start a publication on Medium for free. You can start a podcast on Anchor for free. You can start a group and community um, kind of uh, on virtually you know, many platforms from Facebook and WhatsApp, et cetera, for free. So that's not to say that everything is free and that there's no cost associated with anything, but it's to say that when you're validating an idea in the early phase, there's no need for a lot of capital spending. There's no need for a lot of expensive equipment as you would if you're starting an oil company or some other kind of a venture. So, um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is um, you validate by essentially running small tests. So you essentially start something as a very, very small experiment. You think like a scientist. And scientists, what scientists do is they start with a hypothesis. They say, I think th there's an opportunity here. I think there's a lot of people who are interested in the subject or need to know about the subject and they don't have a good way to get it. And I know that because there's a few ways you can know it. Either you're a part of that community, somebody that close to you and your family or a friend or a colleague or classmate is, is in that community or, or, or you just have knowledge and experience with that community. Um, maybe you've worked with that community before. Um, and, and then you, you kind of uh, consider different options. We call it flaring and focusing. You come up with a lot of different ideas. And you say, of, of the 10 different possible ways to serve this community, here are three that I think I could test out pretty easily. So I'll give you one specific example just to make this point. Um, a student of mine uh, uh, last year had a project in mind. He had worked with people with physical disabilities in New York City. So people who couldn't easily walk around, they used a wheelchair or, or otherwise were physically um, unable to get around the city on, on their own feet. And he, he knew the community pretty well. And he had some ideas about some of the challenges that they face in getting to work and getting their children to, to school and so forth and so on. And there's hundreds of thousands of people in this situation, right? Because New York's a city of 9 million people. So there's a lot of people who have this condition, this situation. And the city, unfortunately, has an urban infrastructure that doesn't necessarily make it easy for everyone. 
who, who has a physical disability to get around easily. And for example, the subway system, uh, on any given day, 40% of the elevators are not in operation. They're out of order. And some, many stations don't have a, su a subway at all. And many of the buses um, do have um, access for people with disabilities, but the buses don't cover the whole city. So, so what he did was he started to have interviews. He started to talk to people in the community who he knew, he, who he worked with, about some of the challenges. What was their day like? What are the challenges they face? And he kept hearing about the subway system and information um, vacuum around the subway. They couldn't find out which subways were open and not, and which elevators were broken or not. So it was a basic information gap that he identified through those user interviews and through that research, right? And then he, and then he ran some experiments. What if I try a newsletter and send this newsletter out to 20 people every day, just a quick update? Or what if I send a WhatsApp message, right? Or what if I send an alert via text message? He tried a few different things and he settled on a certain approach that worked quite well. And it was through iterative user testing with a small group, no investment of money, a little bit of time. And then he expanded that effort, right? To more and more people. And that's the first phase. So does that say this is gonna be a, a meaningful, you know, valuable business in the long run? Not necessarily, right? There's other phases of the testing, but that's the product testing. And first you develop a product, then you build a community around it, then you develop revenue around that. So that's the order, right? Product, then community, then revenue, right? You can't develop a community if you have no product, right? Why would people pay attention to what you're doing if you have nothing to offer them? So you create something to offer people, then you build a community around that, and then once you have a community and you have a product that people are using and, and you're providing some value, then you can find the revenue, right? And there's a lot of different approaches to, to that revenue. Sometimes it's a third party revenue. In the case, in, in this case, you know, the city might find value in providing the service to people. So the city might support it. In other cases, people might support it directly. In still other cases, this innovator has expertise, right? And, and can do consulting on how businesses can support people with disabilities, for example, or can create white papers um, which are of value to companies that are serving people, um, different employees. Um, this person can also provide, um, you know, other kinds of products and services to people in the community. So that's that's a little bit of an example um, to to address that question. Um, there are basically four questions you want to ask whenever you're creating something or thinking about creating something. And this is what I what I call kind of the, the startup checklist. And the first is feasibility. Now, sorry, the first, the first is desirability. Let's start with that, right? Does anyone want this? Is this, is this useful, right? Um, do people need this new service to show you, you know, the coolest spots to skateboard in, in, in Delhi, right? I don't know. I, I don't know if that's useful, if anyone really needs that, right? Um, but maybe they do need um, some, some stats tracking on COVID, right? And where COVID hotspots are growing, right? In, in, in their city. Um, so that's, the, that's desirability, right? Then there's feasibility. Can I actually do this? So can I create the, this data? Do I have data to create these um, these uh, services, these alerts that go out to people, or this this chart that's online, or whatever it is, um, newsletter that that up updates people about COVID? So one of our creators actually created the COVID Data Dispatch, which is coviddatadispatch.com, and it's and it provides data about COVID in a very very successful way. It's growing very very nicely. And, it, and she, she can do it because she has science knowledge and she has a network of scientists that she works with and she has data expertise, et cetera. So, so in, that, in that case, it's desirable, it's feasible. The third is, is it viable? Meaning is there, is there revenue associated with it potentially, right? And it may not come right away, right? It's not gonna be on day one, um, but is there, is, there a, is there a viable path that you can foresee? Can you envision a scenario in which there's some revenue streams that, that might work out? Um, and then the last one is, is it compatible? Um, and that means, you know, is it compatible with your life, with your morals, with your ethics? Is this something you can, you can um, envision doing, in, you know, in conjunction with the other things in your life? You know, you are all, all students, you also have families and, and other um, things to, to occupy you. You know, is this side project or is this potential venture compatible with the rest of your life? And, and is, it, is it moral? Do you feel comfortable and do you feel proud and happy um, doing it? So that's, that's a checklist. Again, desirability, feasibility, viability, and compatibility. Um, and there's a, slide, uh, there's a slide on that that hopefully we'll get to uh, that if you wanna re refer back to that. Um, I'm just looking to see other questions here. Um, how does investment work in media companies and startups without hi any history of success? So 
um, there are a couple ways that, that you can um, get investment. One is family and friends. So people who know you and trust you and believe in you um, can give you money regardless of what you've done in the past, right? Because they know you're smart and you tell them about your idea and they say, sure, I'll give you a couple thousand dollars to you know, get this going, right? Um, so that's one way. Another way is crowdfunding. So you say to the group of people, you know, I'm creating this um, magazine for girls, young girls. So my, my daughter, I, I subscribe to this magazine, um, Bravery Magazine for young girls. It shows, it shows women, basically leaders around the world who are doing cool things in science and other fields um, because a lot of the um, messaging in, in other media forms like women's magazines is not empowering for women. It shows them in you know, dresses and swimsuits and whatnot and it's not positive messaging for young girls, I don't think. So, so there's a, a group that said, we wanna create a different kind of magazine for young girls that's empowering and inspiring instead of you know, sending negative messages about body and appearance. And, um, and they said, do you believe in this? Do you, do you want to have a world where, where people, who, who are women who are growing up, have these empowering messages? And do you, do you believe in that? Do you want to support our mission? And people said, yeah, actually, that sounds pretty cool. I'd like that. I'd like that for my niece or for my daughter or for my friend or whatever. And, um, and they supported it and they raised money. And, and that, that crowdfunding model exists and, it, and it's actually quite, quite substantial for journalism projects. Um, and actually, if you look at Kickstarter, a quick tip is if you look at kickstarter.com, you go to the bottom of the page, there's stats. And you can see, you can break it down. You can see the journalism projects, about 20% of the journalism projects on Kickstarter succeed in raising the funding that they target. And you can see what they, what, which amounts they tend to raise. You can look at the actual projects. It's quite useful if you're interested in that, following that path, even if you're not gonna use that platform just to see the kinds of projects people, people do. Um, and we've had a number of students use um, Kickstarter uh, to raise money, including NK News. So NK News is a project out of our program focused on North Korea. So it's very hard to get good quality news about what's going on in North Korea, as you might imagine. And so Chad, who happens to be a British guy, but he's, he's learned Korean and he, and he, he um, spends his life in that part of the world now, um, he, he decided this was a subject he wanted to cover and he knew he could cover well, and it was a gap he could cover and he, he's made it into a business. And he, at one point, he, he has various revenue streams, which I can talk about later if you're interested in, but one, at one point he created a, a Kickstarter campaign, which raised, I don't know if it was 10,000, I forget the exact amount, but it helped, it helped early on. Um, as a student, is it worth the investment of time and effort to work on a podcast series? I think that anything that you spend your time on in terms of a new project that's, that's giving you entrepreneurial training, um, experience, practice is worth spending time on. I think it's very, very um, useful training for yourself in terms of training your journalism skills, in terms of training your marketing and community building skills, in terms of training your team building skills, in terms of uh, kind of entrepreneurial um, skill set and mindset. So, so I definitely encourage you to do that. I think it's important to be realistic in terms of your expectations, right? You're not gonna get rich overnight. It may not work in terms of reaching a big audience. Most entrepreneurs who are successful, who you read about in magazines or see on TV, you're not seeing them talk about their first project. It's their third or fifth or seventh project, right? And this is true almost across the board. So one of the things that almost all successful entrepreneurs have in common is past failed projects. So you have to try a couple projects before you get to one that really works for the most part. Um, and you learn things in each project. So yes is the answer. Yes, I would definitely encourage you to try, try something. Just be, be, be modest in your expectations, be humble in your approach and be diligent in learning from whatever you do. Um, okay, I'm going to move forward and, and share some more things, and then, and then we'll open up again for discussion toward the end again. Um, so I'm going to um, share again, and um, so I want to share some, you can see the screen again, right? I'm using a backup laptop here, so I'm just yes, adjusting yes, to, yes, the, yes, to the sharing. Can. Okay, so, um, so this is, these are some examples of some of these exciting projects, just for some inspiration. The, 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 these are projects that will launch this year. So the 19th is a project um, run by women, for women, led by women, um, already breaking news. They were the first um, group to interview uh, Kamala Harris, our new vice president in the United States. So they've already had an impact. They've already been growing uh, quite successfully. The Markup also launched um, and they focus on covering technology, not about the shiny new Apple iPhone or, or the wonderful things Google is doing with their new technology, but rather the algorithms that are affecting our world. <laughs> 
and how big tech is, is watching us, et cetera, which, which now we're waking up to more and more, but for a long time, that wasn't what tech coverage was, was by and large focused on. They create products and services as well. So it's not just news. So this is an example of something the markup created. So you can see which sites are, are kind of spying on you, what they're tracking in your um, web behavior, et cetera. The information is a technology news um, service. There are lots of places to find out about technology, right? So you'd think that it'd be hard to charge money for that, but they actually charge uh, $400, 400 US dollars um, per year for high quality news about technology. That's, that, that's, that's really um, often exclusive reporting. It's read by business, business people primarily, um, but anyone who's interested in, in technology in a serious way. Um, this is a local publication that's emerged um, focusing on getting to know readers and, and having the readers help drive the, the conversation. I mentioned NK News in, in North Korea. So those are some of the kinds of examples of things that are emerging focused on particular niche areas. A huge amount uh, has emerged on Substack and on other newsletter platforms. And the idea here is people can just write. They don't have to focus on building technology. They don't have to focus on um, taking care of complicated technical aspects or, or, um, or even think too much about a complicated business model. So they're actually simplifying the business model. So you basically, you start a Substack, you get your own space and you have a simple way to charge. They take a 10% cut and it's pretty much you're off to the races. So um, hundreds of journalists have started Substacks in the past year and it's become a huge, huge new movement in, in journalism. Um, and, and instead of the kind of being part of this big organization as a newspaper, a lot of these journalists are leaving and becoming armies of one. They're becoming independents who basically um, generate revenue through their product directly. So like people are working on Etsy, like people are working on other creator pl platforms, um, these are people who are making a, a substantial living in some cases, not in every case, but in some cases um, doing journalism. Um, this is an example of someone who Casey Newton left The Verge where he was writing about technology. He said, I'm gonna create a new independent newsletter called Platformer. And before he even sent his first issue, 500 people paid him $100. So this was pre-launch. And um, he's obviously a well-known journalist. So, so you know, not every um, person can just do that automatically. But many, many have been able to do that, particularly journalists with, uh, with a community of, of people who know them. So this is Emily Atkins. She writes Heated.News, which is one of the great um, kind of climate-related newsletters. And she is doing really impactful journalism. So for example, she looked at the people in the US Congress who voted to overturn the election recently. And she found that many of them also don't believe in climate change. And she has 2,500 paid newsletter subscribers and that generates a total of $175,000. And that's growing, right? This is, it's a, it's a work in progress, but that's growing and that's, and that's a, a good salary for, for her as an independent journalist. So, you know, th this whole idea that you needed millions of people, you need huge amounts of web traffic, it's really no longer true. You need a small, coterie of people who believe in the work you're doing and support it. Popular information is another example of this. This is in the um, politics realm. Jed Legum is the founder who's done really excellent work. He was one of the people who actually started this move, which became really a national story in the US um, in, the, in recent weeks, basically asking companies, look, do you want to support these people who were supporting Trump and saying that the election you know, should be overturned? And the companies at first weren't sure how to respond. And then eventually an, an avalanche came. And many of the major companies in the US now say that they will not support those people who wanted to overturn the, the, the election. Um, and they now have 138,000 subscribers. And if you think about the percentage, right, many of those people just get it for free. And I'm actually one of them, I get it for free. Um, at some point I may pay because I really like it. He does great work. But as of now, I'm a free subscriber. But, but five to 10% people wanna pay and they might get some additional benefits, right? Like they get access to the archives or they get access to special issues or they get access to a meeting with him um, on Zoom you know, once a month or something like that. Um, he charges $6 a month, that's very common. So many charge $5 a month, $50 a year. Um, and he keeps most of the revenue. Um, if you think about the work that journalists do for their organizations, it's, it's a much different kind of a model right? You, you, you get a salary and regardless of how good the work you do is or how 
influential you are in the organization, you, you're not benefiting from that in a direct way. Um, Substack takes 10% and the credit card processor takes a little bit amount uh, of uh, a little bit. And, and he makes about 300,000. Jeremy Glenn Greenwald, he's on Substack, right? Yeah, many, yeah. many, many, many journalists are doing this. This is, this is one who's not famous though, because I want to give an example of an ordinary person. This is Nathan. He didn't even graduate college. Um, he, he writes this thing called Notes on the Crisis about the pandemic um, sort of monetary impact uh, um, in the economy and finance. He's not, you know, he's not a glorious uh, supermodel. He's not a, he's not a famous journalist. He's just a really smart guy who writes really well about this subject. And this is a recent piece in, in Bloomberg talking about how he, he has managed to really build a business out of this. And he's not making as much as the others yet, um, but he already has 450 paid subscribers making 45,000 plus he's been invited to speak in a lot of places and, and made 20,000 in speaking fees. And this has since um, risen although I don't have an updated number. And a lot of the people that, um, I, I just share this quote because a lot of the people that are gonna do well in this realm aren't necessarily people who are trained as journalists per se, they're people who are doing journalism. So you can do journalism even if you're a scientist or if you're a business person, right? You don't have to be trained in journalism necessarily to be doing journalism. It might be helpful in some cases, um, but in, in, it's not necessary in all cases, right? From the reader's point of view, they want quality information. So if it comes from a scientist or a doctor or a professional um, uh, expert in you know, monetary policy, that's what the user wants. They want the information, they want something they can trust and that has value to them. They don't care what the label is on the person who's doing it. So it's just something to be aware of in terms of where journalism is headed. Um, this is another example. Lindsay is a sports journalist and she's interested in sexism in sports. She writes powerplays.news. She has a thousand subscribers. So it's not a huge number, it's not as many as the others, but she charges also $6 a month, 72 a year. And if you do the math, that's, you know, it's a good starting salary and she's able to be in work independently. And she also does some freelance on the side. Um, and I, I believe in walking the walk and talking the talk, right? So I, I've started a newsletter during the pandemic. Um, in my case, I'm not interested in making a lot of money, um, but I'm interested in learning about the process and, and growth and um, providing value to a community about something that I'm interested in. And, and so I, I, I do believe even if you're not interested in the money part of it, or even if you don't want to build a big business, we should all have some sort of side project, some sort of um, uh, creative outlet that we build. Um, a, somebody mentioned podcast. It could be a podcast. Um, a huge number of podcasts are, have grown. All sorts of new platforms are emerging. Um, Anchor is one I like. It's a simple one. It's completely free. It distributes to all the podcast players. It works on your phone, on, on, on across platforms. It works on the web, um, even allows you to monetize. Um, there's other platforms that allow you to add paid membership like Supercast and Glow. Um, and you can do it on other platforms as well, like, like on YouTube. Um, this is Carlos um, Maza who left Vox and he went basically to, to focus on creating video for YouTube and he uses Patreon to monetize. So Patreon, it allows people to basically subsidize his work and they get some benefits and they can choose, you know, to pay $2 a month or $5 a month or $10 a month. And you can see here, he has more than 1100 patrons. So he's starting to build a, a stable base of, of income from that. Um, the, the reasons to do this, it protects you. The market's evolving. There aren't going to be as many uh, journalism jobs that are traditional jobs in the years ahead. Um, it allows you to do the work that's meaningful to you. You can focus on things that matter to you. You can strengthen your skills. You have to do the reporting. You have to do the editing. You have to do the marketing. You have to do a lot, right? And that's challenging, but it's also skill building. You learn a lot by doing that. And you can have impact, right? If you pick a topic that matters to you, you can really have an impact um, regardless of how young or old you are, regardless of how well-known you are. If you do quality work, you can get it to people directly and, and that can be impactful. Um, let me pause again for, for questions and then actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of skip ahead to, to, um, to some specific practical tips. I just wanna share this chart with you to show that across the world, the, the number of people who are, the percentage of people who are paying for online news is growing. This is from the Reuters Digital News Report 2020 report. And um, I realize India is not on here. India was not surveyed in this, in this data set, but uh, but you can see around the world that, that the number of people who are paying is not huge, 
but it's also not minuscule, right? It's growing. And if you look at Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, Finland, um, it's, 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 it's growing. And, and I think that will continue to be the case. Um, people are accustomed to paying for Netflix, for paying for Spotify, paying for other services like that. And I think we'll see people paying for specific quality news that matters to them um, in increasing, increasing ways. Um, let me pause for, for questions and then I'm gonna share a few final um, kind of specific practical things um, with you. What, what else is on your mind? What else are you curious about? What else do you wanna follow up on? Um, I wanted to ask how relevant is entrepreneurial journalism in this COVID, you know, in the post COVID era exactly? Uh, it's more relevant than ever because large organizations are suffering. So many organizations face a 40% or higher um, diminishment in the, in the ad revenue that they had, right? Because advertisers were pulling back from their ad expenditures. So one of the first things that, that companies in general, right, across industries, one of the first things they do to save money is they reduce their ad budget, right? And if they reduce their ad budget, they don't reduce their Facebook ad budget, they reduce their newspaper, magazine, TV, other kind of traditional journalism ad budget first. So newspapers, news organizations of various kinds were hit hardest and they were, um, they were declining, right? And they were laying off people. So in the US alone, 11,000 people lost their jobs in journalism um, in, in 2020. Um, that's a, that's a, a conservative estimate, probably actually more if you include um, a variety of different kinds of outlets. Um, so, so what that means is where, where people still need news and they still need information Right? So it's just coming from more from independence and there's a growth of independence. So entrepreneurial journalism is more, more relevant than ever before and it will continue to be so. Um, it's also relevant, not just because of the economic factors, but because you know, if you think about how people consume information, people want specialty information, right? They don't just want sports information. They want information about you know, Barca or, or Manchester United, or they, or they don't just want science information. They want COVID information about their city, right? Or they don't just want um, business information. They want to know how the you know commodity sector in Afghanistan is going to be affected by whatever it is, right? They want very specific information. They want to find that niche that's going to serve them, and that is often done well by by entrepreneurial journalists and independent journalists and small niche organizations, as opposed to these large organizations that tend to have more kind of general commodity kind of news. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here to a, a few specific um, lessons in, in kind of how to thrive. Um, and I'm going to share again and show you a few more of these and then, and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. Um, so in terms of the revenue streams, you know, a lot of people wonder, well, how can you make money at this? There's a lot of different ways. In fact, there's a, a, a um, there's a recent collection that a colleague of mine put together with 231 different revenue streams employed by different news organizations, right? And what that means is that instead of just charging for content directly or charging for ads, people are being very, very creative about how they're earning revenue. And that's where some really creative, innovative approaches are, are coming. And, and these are just some examples, right? So we, we're familiar with subscriptions um, but increasingly, we're finding people um, creating new kinds of membership where people are part of a community. And it's not, it's, it's not just about transactional, you give me this money, I'll give you this content. It's about join us and be part of this community. And that can mean a lot of different things, depending on what the community is about. Um, it's also about services. So I'll give you an example of that. One of our projects in 2012 was called Narratively. It's high quality, long form storytelling, feature stories. And one of the things narratively does is create um, special content for businesses. It doesn't go on their website. It goes just to the businesses. So they have a sort of an agency that works on the side because people who read the site know how good their videos are and know how good their design is and infographics and all the stuff that they do. So for example, GE General Electric paid them $5,000 to create a video about wind power. And um, and they don't cover GE, so there's no conflict of interest. They don't cover hard news. And yet this money allows them to support, to provide a free website for people, right? And, and allows the creators who make the video to make substantial money, right? And they create a lot of other, they do a lot of other kinds of services like that. 
Um, so that's that, that that's an example of of, uh, of one of these alternative revenue models. Um, so a few lessons learned. Um, these are things that you can you can apply in your own work. Uh, one is start with your own strengths. So you can start with the needs of the community. That's a good way to start. But you can also start with your own strengths. So you can think about this as your hands, your head, your heart, right, and your network. So what what you can do? So can you translate into into Chinese, right? Or can you do coding? Or can you create amazing infographics? Those are all skills you can have, right? You may already have. There's knowledge you have. You may know about the history of Chennai and the politics there, or you may know about um, how it feels to have a particular disability or to to, to live in a particular way, right? Um, you may know. Um, any number of different things, right? That you have that's knowledge that's that's special to you and that you have that's distinctive. You also may have an interest or a passion in a certain subject. And then finally, you have a network of people that you know and that you can reach out to and that can be collaborators or that can help you distribute content or that can help you partner um, in various different ways. And so one of the things I encourage you to do is take stock of those things. A lot of us don't aren't fully aware of all of our strengths. And so I encourage you to kind of map these things out and sometimes then you compare them with a problem you've identified or a gap in the marketplace. So this is where to find ideas. You start with those four, your capabilities that I just mentioned, your skills, your knowledge, your interests, and your network. You also look outward at the community. What are problems you identify in communities you're a part of? And these can be social communities. They can be geographic communities. They can be religious communities or ethnic communities. They can be any kind of community, school community, professional community. Um, you identify problems or gaps or needs that that community has. The final area that you can find ideas is, is a catalyst from, ex, uh, from, from outside of yourself, right? And outside of your community. It could be something that's happening, right? So the, the, the Olympics are happening again this summer if they actually happen, right? Um, people can create content specific to that, right? Because that's something that's going to be a, a, a flashpoint of interest, right? Davos is a flashpoint of interest when it happens over that period of time. Um, the COVID pandemic is a, is a flashpoint of interest, right? Those, these are external catalysts that happen. Sometimes there are new technologies that develop. Um, there's new battery technology that's developing that's going to have a big impact on the world in the next um, 10 years. Um, there's a huge range of climate impacts that are developing that are going to have a huge impact. Those are external catalysts that you can use to um, find opportunities for, for areas of coverage that, that are, in, in, that are um, needed. So this is, this is a little bit about thinking about those communities, what communities you're a part of that you can use to source ideas and to develop an, an awareness of what's missing and what, what opportunities there are. In terms of actually launching the products, um, start small. So start with a little objective, send a newsletter to five or 10 people. Just send one um, you know, email with a few specific things and, and ask people if this topic's interesting to them or create a manifesto on Medium, right? It's basically just a 500 word or a thousand word piece about something you care about, you believe in, or you know about, and, and, uh, and, and put that out there as a kind of a stake in the ground and share it with a few people and see, see if you get some feedback and see what they think about it and see if, if there's room to jump off of and do a little more. Or record a five minute audio conversation with someone interesting and important or meaningful or, or record five minutes of audio on your own. Um, and, and use that as a little, little test, right? Little hypothesis that you have and test that. Um, put it in front of real people, even if, you're, even if it's not perfect, it won't be perfect. Um, and try to identify something that really matters to people. Um, so painkillers are a lot more valuable than lollipops, right? They taste bad, they're expensive, sometimes they're hard to get, but we still use them because pain is important to us, right? Um, so think about something where there's real, really a need for, for that. Um, and then ultimately you're thinking about the product itself. Like what value are you actually creating for people? Who are you creating it for? Who can you serve? And don't focus as much on yourself as on the people you're serving. And, uh, and then think about the sustainability aspect. Even if you're not generating revenue early on, you can sort of have an eye on that, how that could develop over the long run. Um, these are what I consider to be the, the seven core steps. So you learn something about a community, about a problem, about a challenge, about yourself. Then you launch something, a quick experiment. Then you grow that, you add a few other people, you get some more feedback. Um, you potentially test out a revenue stream. You see if there's some revenue out there that you might be able to generate. You, you gather a team, you, you gather a partner, you work with someone else. 
find someone to collaborate with. Um, you adjust, you iterate, you improve, make it a little bit better to change it. Maybe it started out as a podcast and you switched to a newsletter, or maybe you tried to build a website and then you realize all you need is a newsletter. Um, and then ultimately, maybe you finish that process. Um, you know, most things don't last forever. So you can have the end in mind and what do you really want to learn from the pro project? What are your goals? Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and kind of have the, that in mind, even as you're beginning something, what's the real purpose you have in mind? And these are the, the four uh, questions that I mentioned earlier, desirability, feasibility, viability, and compatibility. And I think I'll pause there and, uh, and see what kind of final questions you have. And I have a couple of, of, of poll questions for you too, but let, let me get your, um, your questions um, first. So what questions do you have about any of that? Or, or, or if you have an idea, um, feel free to, to put that idea out there and I, I'll, I'll give you uh, my immediate input. Not that, not that I have any expertise in, in whatever your idea is about, but I can just give you my personal take. Shoot, guys, shoot. <laughs> Try to make the most out of it. Uh, I have a question, not an idea. <laughs> yeah, so uh, suppose there is an idea and we have like jumped off the jumping off point and we have gone to a certain stage where we need to start thinking like entrepreneurs. So we are journalism students here, but at least I am not, I don't have any business background whatsoever. So how do you, how, like, what would you advise we do so that at some point we start thinking like an entrepreneur who wants to take their idea to the next level? Yeah, so, so I think many journalists are in your position. They're not business experts. They have no business background. And, and in fact, that's why Substack is so popular, right? Because all you have to do is start writing and then you decide to charge and the platform takes care of everything else. So I, I think that's a very common situation. I think the key thing is that the business doesn't really have to come from day one. I mean, I, I think there's, there's value in kind of identifying for yourself, you know, what your purpose is and, and and thinking about it, but, but really what you're doing from day one is just creating something that's useful for people. So if you focus on product, I mean, Jeff Bezos always talks about this, right? Like slavish attention to customer needs and customer desires, like focus on the customer above all else. And it, it, you know, it sounds like cliche because he's so rich and so successful, but th there's a lot of truth to that. If you focus on creating a newsletter that's really useful for people, after some period of time, they will share it with other people. And after some time, those people who are reading it week after week will want to support you. They will say to you, you know, how can I support you? Would you, you know, is there a way I can pay for this, right? People will, will come to you with opportunities. They'll say, hey, would you speak at our event, right? Hey, will you create, you, you created this really great project, this great visual. Can you create a visual for us, right? Can you coach me? I need to create something. Can you work, join our team? They'll say, I have a job. Can you come and work on my team? I want to hire you, right? These things happen. One of my former students created something called Reporters, which was a um, newsletter focused on interviews with leading women journalists. She went to an interview and somebody said, you write that newsletter? <laughs> she got the job, right? They, 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 didn't, they already knew her work and they were desperate to have her on their team. So it, it opens up all kinds of opportunities, whether you're earning revenue directly or not. And you don't have to have that in mind. You don't have to focus on that. You have to focus on creating something that's useful. If you create something that's very useful for people, even a small group of people, over time, the opportunities will emerge from that. And, and, and you can't focus on everything at once, right? You have, as, as an individual person, you have to focus on one small step at a time. And the first small step is, what, what can I do that will be useful for other people? How can I add to the world? What can I make that's useful for people that would add meaning? And maybe you do it with someone else. You know, maybe you have a collaborator. That's a good way to, 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 um, to get started as well. Um, so I see a question. Is there an example which you can share about non-English marginalized community oriented journalism startups? Do the same principles apply there or is there a difference? Yes, every market is different, right? So every situation, every context is different. Some things are the same and some things are different. So the things that are the same are you have to think about the same kinds of four startup checklist things. Do people actually want this, right? Is this useful for people in the real world? Whether they're in non-English, whether they speak Martian, whether they're in a tiny community in a swamp somewhere, or whether they're in a big city in a big country, doesn't matter. There's still people, there's still humans, they still have needs, and they still have um, information needs specifically. 
Um, so, so you still think about, is this desirable? Is this useful for someone? How can I make this more useful for someone? What platform or what approach or what style or what length would make it useful for someone? And what language would make it useful for someone? Um, and, and you still have the same questions like, how can I do this? How, how, what should the product look like? What should it feel like? Those kinds of questions are the same. Now, the specifics, the execution specifics are gonna be context specific, right? So for example, um, I, I worked with a bunch of um, uh, uh, journalists in, in Latin America and in different parts of Latin America and Central America, there's different payment platforms and there's different issues with, you know, what people will pay for and they pay through their phone provider and so forth. And so you have to work through the specifics of the execution in different ways. Um, and the platforms are sometimes different, right? In Japan, they may use Line. In South Korea, they use Kakao Talk. You know, there's different sort of specific delivery mechanisms that are specific to different places. And you'll know those well because you're, you know, you're going to work with a community that's, that's close to you. Um, in terms of examples, yes, I can give you lots and lots of examples. Um, I'll share with you a link here, um, which has some additional resources, um, which you can explore. And there's lots of good um, write-ups about, um, about uh, in entrepreneurial journals and startups from around the world um, that are included in this collection of links and resources. Um, there's also something called the Membership Puzzle Project, which I highly recommend to you, which has a bunch of very short, easy case studies, of just a page or two each. And they include a um, variety of different examples from different parts of the world. Oops, I think I just sent that to, to, uh, to one person accidentally. Let me resend that link to, to all of you. Any other questions? We're, we're, I think we're, Deb, we're out, we're uh, kind of moving toward the end of our time here, right? Any more questions, Guy? Uh, all right. Okay, thank you so much indeed, uh, Jeremy. And it's been wonderful and it's been so informative and we look forward to actually working with you again. Absolutely. I have one final question, which is I'd like feedback from from you all, this is anonymous, so you can say whatever you think. If I bored you to tears, you can say that. If you found something uh, specific that was interesting, you can say something specific um, that was useful. If there's something that yeah. uh, that you have to share, um, I, I value that feedback. And can I share your email you with them? You know, some of you are going to yeah, bug sure. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, so um, I'll put my email in here. Um, and if you're and interested the, in the, and the presentation in the tools piece, uh, specifically, yeah, I'll, I'll share yeah. the presentation. Because he's, got a, he's got a newsletter called the General Toolbox in because um, you subscribe to that. Yeah, if you're interested in the specific execution tools, that's uh, some of that stuff is in the newsletter. It's not about entrepreneurial journalism per se. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there already about that. Um, um, and if you're interested in finding out more about our programs at the school, um, I'll put that link in here as well. That's bit.ly slash newmark JCP. I just put the link in the, in the chat. Yeah, actually quite a few are interested in the program, you know. We've, we had a lot of interest from India this time, actually, this, this mm. second cohort. Um, so uh, th that's that's been a place we've had a lot of, um, and actually over the years, we've had a lot of great people, including from your school, um, uh, who have done very well in, in the program. Um, and and uh, regardless of whether you do use a program or not, again, I just want to encourage you to 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 try something. You know, if 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 you try something and, and you fail, that's that's better than not having tried anything at all. And actually, there's no real there's no real thing as as failure in this regard because you're learning from it. It's a learning process. You know, it's 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 not about you know making lots of money or or reaching millions of people. It's about kind of learning about your own skills, developing some new skills, experimenting, trying something out. Um, it's much, much better than just doing, you know, what someone else tells you to do all the time. You know, a lot of people, especially students, get into the mindset that the teacher tells you what to do. Um, and and the, the sooner you can shift out of the mindset and start thinking for yourself and creating your own things, the better. Okay, thank you so much indeed. You know, it's been so informative and valuable. And, and uh, we'll get back to you, Jeremy. And I, I'm good. sure a lot of them are going to get back to you too. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah. You too. Hi. Bye-bye.
拜拜。Thank you, sir. Thank you. Don't forget. Ah, there will be one more thing. You know, just uh, share yes. the. Yes. Can, can I can I share the presentation? Can we? Pri privately with this group, I wouldn't share it publicly. No, with me, yeah. So I'll just. I'll, uh, share, I'll share it with you, and 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 you can share with this this yes, group privately sure. Thank for, you. for today's session. Yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'll leave the I'll leave the feedback thing open, so you can share yeah. that after this. Yeah. After sure. Closes. Go on. Great. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>